One of the common themes that we've been talking about today is just this notion of play. And I'm going to be talking about the way that I think about play in my classroom and uh, even just like the notion of prototypes. So hi, everybody. My name is Miggy. I'm a designer advocate here at Figma. Uh, I've joined Figma uh, coming from RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology, where I taught uh, new media design, visual communications design, uh, master's program. Uh, I've been teaching on and off at RIT since about 2005 uh, in those programs. Uh, I also have a master's in industrial design. I know that Shay mentioned that earlier, and then I think it really shapes just my approach to things and, and having that, that need to kind of design things around me. So uh, educator, designer, I illustrate a little bit as well. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about prototyping, and basically a prototype is anything that you build that can just help you test something out. So a poster can be a prototype. Um, you know, cardboards, can be used in making a prototype. And I'm gonna be talking about prototyping in Figma to test out those ideas. So often I would teach interaction design classes and students would design these interfaces for mobile, phone, tablets, websites, et cetera, that would be you know pristine. And then they would fear actually prototyping them, testing them out, seeing how the interactions may work when going from one thing to the next. As demonstrated in Libby's example, you know, making that prototype, showing that working example helps them to communicate their ideas. So once again, they just think that everything needs to be perfect all the time. And it's really up to you, the educator, to let them know and give them the space to uh, work out their ideas. So I wanted students to always do this. They should prototype early. They should prototype often. Um, even before they begin making their design visuals, they should think about how things work and how that space uh, uh, behaves. Uh, they need to make those mistakes. They need to fail sooner. Um, so basically with this workshop today, uh, there's going to be two portions of this, right? I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell, and then we're going to uh, uh, invite some folks to be in a file with me. And I'm going to walk you through how I engage in that space. Uh, but the key lesson is to play try things out on a small scale and make space for failure, right? Give them the confidence to uh, do things and not make it perfect all the time. So new tools and concepts such as Figma, and, and this has a lot to do with the way that I introduce Figma into the classroom, you know, they are gonna be, perform best when you have that curiosity, right? And that play involved. Um, so in Figma too, you will notice that there's a play button. Whenever you go to hit prototype, right? You hit a play button to engage in that prototype. So it's called that for a reason. So I'm going to take you a look through some of my examples that I have here. I'm going to close out this prototype, which was my slide deck. That's what I was presenting off of. And that's what we've been presenting off of today. And I'm going to walk you through some uh, levels in this file. So different pages, as, as Matt had already demonstrated. So the first thing that I did in my journey, and uh, as I go through these, what I want you to do is in the chat, let me know, you know, if this is inspiring any ideas that you may have, right? And I'm just going to walk you through a bit of my journey in, in prototyping things out and seeing how the tool works and how it's meant to uh, work with me and how I get students to do this as well. So the first simple practical prototype I made with students is this, right? I wanted to emulate exactly what it was that we were building. So I was like, let's make an example of a mobile prototype. Like let's put it in, in the thing, right? And you know, this worked out, it was simple. They understood it and they grasped the concept. However, I thought it was very boring. So I wanted to push those paradigms a little bit further. So looking beyond just those uh, simple click interactions, um, one one thing that I wanted to do is uh, I wanted them to think and look around them at the type of interactions that they're experiencing. So think of even something like Netflix, right? So when you're interacting with a television, you're not moving a cursor around and clicking, you're actually moving focus. So imagine the Netflix interface, you're interacting with that remote control. Um, so here I was able to use Figma's kind of like key interaction. So I'm using my keyboard going left and right. I'm also making use of this concept called Smart Animate. And what Smart Animate does is it examines each frame in the prototype and it attempts to animate between those frames. So it looks and says, okay, how are these things changing over time? And this is important for the workshop that we're going to be doing later. And, you know, just thinking about how that might move and, and what interests me is, you know, just this kind of play, you know, and I'll, I'll throw in like little, little, little bits in there too, to just kind of, you know, have some fun. So 
making these small little examples to examine and, and play with and including the students in these files. Uh, so I'm going to go to my next one. Uh, I would challenge my students to create a large collaborative project where they're working together, where they have a common goal, where they're going to define their own constraints. So they're going to say, this is what we're going to build, and this is how we're going to do it, and this is what each student is responsible for. So in this case, I wanted them to build out and ABC book, and I wanted it to be one large collaborative prototype. I didn't even know whether or not it could be done, but I looked at Figma. I saw that all of the students can be in the same place. They can work on design together, so maybe they can make a very large prototype together. So I didn't want them to be bound or feel bound by some of those perceived limitations, right? Um, so I would make a lot of really weird examples. I would say, hey, look, you can totally do it. This is, let's just make something. So I'm going to hit play on that. And this is an example. I just live demonstrated the building of this with them just to say like, hey, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but I'm just going to put some things together and explore and see what this can be. So what I did was I made a little drag here, right? And this drag brings up this like little interface. And you saw the scroll of the vertical content that looks like, you know, navigating any uh, uh uh, what is it like news website right and so i use that scroll and i was like okay let's take that horizontal and let's let's make that the basis of the navigation and let's say oh okay cool now we have a new area for content let's play around around a little bit more with that drag see what's possible you know let's take a look at something else here i'm just incorporating animated gifs we would like search on dribble and on some like uh, stock sites for, for graphics, and we would throw them in just to see what is possible. So once again, these are just concepts brought in from Dribbble, and we would just play this. So I would just throw it on the screen, see if it works. Okay, let's go. Now you'll notice that not all of these letter works, letters work, and, and that wasn't my concern. I just wanted to see how could we get things going. So I also made W work, and I took that concept of scrolling up and down, and I said, Figma provides this ability to add in another dimension. So, oh, hey, I could scroll up, down, left, and right. And then we just threw some animated GIFs in there and try to say, okay, maybe you can have something a bit more exploratory. So when you're telling a story, what are your storytelling tools? You know, is there some sort of proximity-based or spatial-based deduction? And then even at this point, what other interactions can you have to kind of disclose new information? Are there affordances involved? And, and there actually isn't an affordance here. An affordance being any property allowing you to understand that this is something that you can interact with. But I clicked on this and then there we go. I got sup bub, right? And then I can click on this and, and basically they can make these fun little games. And this was still pretty early on uh, when Figma wasn't as fully featured as it is now, but still gave them a lot of space to, to play and it just would give them ideas, right? So I just didn't want them to make the simple kind of click based interactive uh, pro prototypes. So I like to try new things and I like to see how far I can push the technology. And a lot of times those explorations will then lead into something that is more functional and that is a little bit more relational. So sometimes I, I, I will take those GIFs and I'll say, hey, can I animate a GIF from one frame to another and what might it look like? Um, so I made this simple click through one day, just, just trying things out and trying to break the tool essentially and seeing what can come up with. And then this idea would then spark another idea. And I was like, okay, if I can accomplish that level of motion here in Figma, which is not a tool, which is really set up for that way, but what might it inspire and, and how can I use this to solve an answer, right? So then a student would come up to me and they would look at an interface and they would say, hey, I see this shutter icon, uh, this aperture icon. How might I use this or how might I animate this in Figma? How can I get this to work? And I would look at those previous examples and then I would take a look and I would deconstruct it. And then I would start to see how can we make more relevant interactions from those. So you can see, you know, more abstract concept kind of playing around with some sort of like interactive model to playing around with some animation, but then making something that is a little bit more, more functional in that approach. And I have uh, files for these. They're available on figma.com slash at Miggy, and I will be sharing some of these resources. Um, so check out, look out for those emails if you're looking to play around with some of these. Um, let's head on to the, to the next. So 
what I began doing, um, and once again, this was during the pandemic, uh, I wanted to ha give students a very good lab experience where we were working on a concept, giving them small examples with very low stakes, right? And I didn't want to define too hard the parameters, and I just wanted them to play around with it. So in the course, we're actually designing interfaces, we're designing uh, interactions, where we're thinking through, you know, information, higher hierarchy, space, form, or thinking spatially, but really to, to accomplish these things, you have to know how to just move things. You have to know how to, how to construct things. And, and that's why I devised this like little mini lab where I would have students, um, you know, we'd all work in the same file and each student would create a new page and that would be theirs. And I can go up and down and see what they were working on. And Figma has this ability to, uh, when I go over in a prototype mode, so right now I'm in design mode, now I'm in prototype mode. Prototype mode is gonna allow me to create those, those relationships between each of those frames to make those animations and interactions. So here you can see I have many different starting points and these are just copied over from those students' frames. Let's take a look at some of them now. And the prompt was simply make a sequence, right? In the same way that Libby was presenting the lemonade, the way that the lemonade would fill, I wanted those students to sort of represent the passage of time. How might they sort of represent this? So here on hover, you know, the student was experimenting with these shapes and seeing how might they transition? How can they transition color? What would the movement look like? And what they're taking advantage of right here is what's referred to as after delay. Um, when you're thinking of the interaction, you can have a click, you can have a hover, you can have a, a mouse down, a mouse up, but this awesome little interactive bit, which we're going to be highlighting in the actual workshop, is going to result in, you know, just a little bit of time waited, and then it's going to move on to the next frame. So we're going to move on and, and show some more of those student examples. So here, you know, kind of like representing the passage of time, taking apart those little bits. Um, here, this student was just like, okay, you know, I have this, you know, crazy idea, uh, and I'm going to see if I can put it into use. And, you know, just visualizing this, right? So this was like a two hour lab where they're just exploring before they get into any deep dive interface design, you know, before they try to transition those screens, they're getting a sense of how might they even express themselves uh, with shape, form, motion, and time. Um, so here we go, another student, once again, just using line shapes to then kind of tell a story, right? So we have this story of this spider kind of moving up and down. So how are they representing these things graphically? And then meanwhile, while they are also working, I am working as well. So I'm working alongside them. I am looking up and down on their pages. I'm seeing what they're doing. I'm providing assistance, but then I am doing like little examples. So these are examples that I would come up with during the class and, and just try out and try out things with them. And I would work with them to try out similar things. So even here, this is just like a globe representing a, a sphere, almost like deconstructing the earth. Um, and this is just using very, very simple shapes and a lot of those progressive frames. Uh, I'm actually going to hop out of this and show you what that file looks like. So here we go. You can see that progression in those frames. I'm going to press Shift O. So any of you here familiar with like other design applications, I'm basically showing you what's underneath the hood. And there is no programming involved here. All that we're doing is I'm just moving these like little objects. I'm creating those shapes. I'm manipulating the color in that space to then kind of present that here. And what I'm doing is I'm relying on the computer to, to kind of transition between those. So um, the next thing is, is that students would say, hey, there's no way we can do this. Like uh, a whole semester, make an entire, you know, book. And, and this is the ABCs project. They're like we can't do it. And I told them, hey, we could do it in like two to three hours together right now. And uh, I took them to task. So this was a lab session that we did. We did it fully remote. And what I basically did was I gave every student the task of creating a few frames of this ABC book, highlighting an animal uh, based off of their name. So if their name was Miguel, they would do a mandrill. If their name was Ali, they would do an aardwolf. And they can pick the animals. And, and this is what we did. So each of these columns is the individual student working on that work. And what I did was I just linked this global navigation to each one of those. 
And so I'm going to hit play. And once again, you know, just mindful that this content, we're just grabbing things off of the internet. You know, this is just nothing that they're going to put in their portfolio. This is just a test. This is playing together. This is trying things out. And we use that exact same shelf paradigm where we would bring up, you know, this little shelf and we would then go and play these things. Now to the students, they just think, okay, yeah, we're just doing this. We did it. Okay. This is fun. They didn't realize that we we're really engaging in a lot, you know, like we were working together and creating something very larger than ourselves. Like we effectively put this entire thing together and students really had a lot of fun. You know, I didn't really set parameters on what was right or what was wrong. So they really loosely defined what could be considered scrolling and what those interactions could entail. And they just went with it, you know, and the more fun they had, the more that they learned, the more comfortable they were kind of expressing themselves and, and, and collaborating and, and contributing to this project. Um, so once again, I use Figma itself to actually demonstrate a lot of these concepts because, you know, we're thinking about motion and motion in interaction design is very, very important. So Libby was even speaking earlier in the way that you use motion to express yourself, right? The way that you're communicating. So they would see all of these different ease names and they had no idea what they meant and they were afraid to use them. So I was like, let's make a chart for ourselves to better understand understand how that motion works. So I will demonstrate, you know, in the in the second half of the workshop, how to access this, how to change that motion. But what we did was we just provided and, and worked on these examples together. So then they had something that was then a resource that they can use. And I think that this is something that has been, you know, absolutely mind blowing with me with Figma is that you essentially build your own tools, right? So I built my own sort of teaching apparatus with Within the tool, you know, that we're using to, to, to work together with one another. So I'm able to, to better explain how these eases work, you know, using the tool that they're going to use to make those eases into articulating their motion. So, you know, one thing here too that I want to highlight is that uh, I try to stay curious. You know, um, I'm always looking to see if there's a better way to do something, or I'm always looking to see if there's another way to do something. Um, I try to maintain maintain that healthy curiosity. And the thing that I want to highlight here is there's an infinite treasure trove of inspiration in the questions that your students will ask you. You know, pay attention to the questions that they're asking. Um, I found out that like, if I just say, no, there's no way to do it, then I'm going to shut them off. If they ask a question, hey, how can we do this? I'm like, let's find a way to do it. Even if the answer isn't in Figma, maybe there's another way that you can do it in another application and you can bring it here. I don't want to limit them. And I don't want to limit myself. So I will oftentimes use their questions as avenues for my own exploration and what I determine to be kind of like, you know, like a worthy thing. So once again, you know, in the chat, let me know if you have like any thoughts, if this is inspiring at all. Um, we're going to begin moving on to the second half in a moment. I'm going to show you these last two examples that I produced while I've been at Figma. Uh, this first one, Kate, was, was simultaneous with the release of a, a uh, feature feature called interactive components. And the purpose of interactive components allows you to have interactions within a single frame. So it allows you to package up something. So if you can imagine like a button click or like a little switch turning on and off, you can package that up and that way you can reuse it. So here, what I am doing is I've made these like little X's and O's that have their own exploratory paths. So I'm using interactive components to make this little interaction. So you see it goes from point A to point B, right? And then you make a decision, right? There's a decision tree here, so I can go left or right. So depending on what you click, you might click on the X, it'll then go to the X. You might click on the O, then you might go to the O. And then you have to return to the origin. So the X has to transition back to being blank back to the original part, or the O has to transition back to being blank, back to the original part. So with this exploration, what it allows is for a more dynamic composition of things on the screen. So you're no longer limited to kind of predetermining all of those click paths. So you can imagine saying, I'm clicking on home, I'm clicking on the about page, I'm going to portfolio page, there's only three paths. But when you have this more dynamic operation of interactions, you can start to create this like cool, complex 
complexity. And that fascinated me. Um, and it allowed me to think through how to make these other animations as well. This is another example where someone on the internet was just like, hey, how would I make a DNA icon or how might I animate a DNA icon. So what I did was, you know, I looked at this concept and here I'll show you how this is constructed. I just created a single animation of this, these two dots and a rectangle between them, right? And then I just decreased the space between the two dots and the rectangle, and then I increased them. So I'm just looking at that single concept of those two dots and then coming back. And then I initiate a bit of complexity where each of these are all an instance of that same part, right? So they're all the same bit, this one right here, this is a, a component. This is an interactive component. And they're using that after delay to go one to next. Now, when I hit play, you actually see, you know, it appears much more complex than it is. You know, you start getting this really, oops, uh, and I broke it, but there we go. You start getting this like really cool sort of representation of, of, of that concept. And, you know, you find a new avenue for, for creating it through that play and through that exploration. So now we're going to move it on to the uh, exploration part. I'm going to share this link and I'm going to talk through what I am uh, doing with, with all of you so you can kind of see this experience. I'm going to copy the link and Alex is going to paste it into the chat. I'm going to paste it into the chat. When you join this file, you are joining this file as a viewer. So right now, you can't manipulate the things that are on my canvas. You're able to see them. You're able to kind of look through. You can look at the second page. You can look at the first page. But you're not going to see exactly what it is I'm seeing. You're not going to be able to manipulate that. As a matter of fact, if I'm working here, um, I can even choose to turn off the multiplayer so I have a little bit of surreal greenness and calm, um, but you're able to be in the same place that I am. Now, if you wanted to copy this file yourselves into your own Figma document, if I click on this little arrow right here, you should be able to do that as well. And you'll see duplicate to your drafts. This will give you a copy of this file. So then you can also follow along, do your own thing. But what I am going to do now is I'm going to walk through this activity. Uh, I'm going to walk through another individual, my, my, my colleague Lauren, through this activity. And then I'm going to invite some of you. I'm going to promote you to editors. So then that way you too can participate. Now, if you don't get promoted to an editor, you at home, home can also duplicate this to your drafts. And then when you duplicate it, it'll give you an option to, to edit it onto your, to yourselves. Okay. So let me head back to my previous document. There we go. So you can do those two things. Let me walk you through here what this is going to be all about. So first off, let me start at the end. So here I have a shape story in three frames. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit play. So then that way you can see what's taking place, right? So what I am making taking advantage of here is the prototype function in Figma, right? I'm using uh, the smart animate and I'm using that after delay um, and just doing a bit of exploration here. So I'm playing around with this square and, and I'm watching it as it moves from one to next. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what's happening there as well. So uh, what I'm going to do is in order to prototype, you must create a frame. So I'm going to press the F key. The F key is going to pull up the frame tool. The frame tool is right here. I'm going to draw a frame out. If I hold the shift key, it will keep the constraints of that frame to be nice and square. So let's say right now this square is about 428 by 428. Uh, let's make it a good even 400 by 400. Now the way that Figma works, all of the main access to the tools are here. The pages are over here on the left. The layers are just beneath that. So everything on the canvas, which is in the middle here, is all layered up. Over here to the right, you'll see there's the properties menu. Anything that you have selected over here on the left will be um, uh, 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 able to be controlled over here on the right. So I can control the properties of this frame over here on the right. So I have one frame. So I'm just going to name this, uh, let's say, start, right? And then I'm going to have a second frame, and I'm just going to say this is 
middle. And you'll notice I'm duplicating this. So I'm holding down the option key. If you're on Windows, it's the Alt key. If you're on Chromebooks, it's the search key. And if I drag that over, you'll see I'll have three of these. So I'm just going to say end. So I'm going to tell a story in three parts. What I'm going to do too is in this file, so I have assets. These are just components that I have already made. I find it helpful to have components that I've already made to share with students. And I'll show you how I make an asset right now. Now. So I'm going to go ahead right here to my shapes menu and I'm going to draw a shape. So I'm going to let's make a little star. I'm going to drag out that star. Now, as I mentioned, any object that you have on the canvas, there are properties over here on the right. So I'm going to select this object. I'm going to change some of those properties. I'm going to make it a, let's say, six point star. Uh, I can change like that little bit of an angle in there as well. I can also round out those corners. So here we go. I have that star. Let's change that color. I'm going to change it to blue and give it a, a stroke of uh, let's say like one right there, okay? Uh, for this exercise, I'm also gonna right click. I'm gonna outline my strokes just so that way they're, they're easily to maintain. So in order to make this into something that is reusable, I'm gonna come right up here and make that component and I'm gonna name it a star. Components are a major aspect of Figma. If you're familiar with other design tools, they might be referred to as symbols. Essentially what it is, is, is a reusable element within your design. Now that I've made this and I've added this to the lineup, when I go to my assets panel, I will see another star here. So I can go ahead and I could drag that star right onto my canvas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate the same star across each one of these frames. Now, to uh, actually uh, kind of change things up a bit, I'm going to change some of its properties. So I'm gonna scale it, I'm gonna rotate it. And when I select this shape down here, we have this selection colors, I'm gonna choose a different color for each one. Right, so I have one, two, three. Now what I wanna do is I wanna create a relationship between these frames and that is gonna cause this change between them. So I'm gonna go over to my prototype menu. So right now we're in design mode. I'm gonna go over to prototype mode. And this is also a great shortcut to learn. Shift E will put me in a prototype mode and shift E will then put me back into design mode. Shift E, shift E, shift E. It's the shifty key, right? You don't really trust it, but you know it's kind of helpful. It's shifty. There we go. So now I'm in prototype mode. In prototype mode is where we create the relationships between the frames to make those interactions. So here I'm going to select that first frame. So I'm going to click on this little plus and watch what I'm doing here. I'll zoom in a little bit, right? So watch, I'm dragging this frame and it's going to snap to another one. Right, And what that's doing, it's creating an interaction. And that interaction is basically saying that there is an event that's going to take place. And you first choose that event. So it can be on click, on drag, while hovering. For now, let's just leave it as on click. And then we have it perform something as a result of that interaction. Right, So it's like, I clicked, now what? So I clicked, now I'm going to navigate to another frame. And that frame has a name, it's called middle. And then we're going to now choose what's going to happen in between those frames. So if it's instant, you won't see any transition. What we want to do is instead choose a transition that is something that we expect. And because we're focused on experimenting and animating, I'm going to choose Smart Animate. And what Smart Animate is going to do is look at the difference between those properties. It's going to go from being like a small star to a larger star. And the computer is going to make up the frames in between in a process that is known as tweening. So if anybody has ever been familiar with Adobe Flash, this is pretty much the same thing, uh, same process there. So I'm going to navigate to middle. I'm going to Smart Animate. And then here are those eases that I mentioned. Um, and we actually just added a whole bunch of new types of eases that are more bouncy. So we have gentle, quick, bouncy, and slow. Um, because I'm a bit of a nerd, I like to draw my own curve. I like to make a little S. And that S means that it's going to start up kind of slow and then end up kind of slow. So it's going to gain speed and it's going to lose speed. So it's going to gain speed, it's going to lose speed. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to make that take place over 450 milliseconds. And what I'm going to do now that that has been set, when I draw this next interaction, 
So here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make sure that it goes to the next frame. Um, you'll see that a lot of my, my settings are maintained. It's keeping those settings. So let's go ahead on this last frame, have it go all the way back to the first frame again. And you can move these frames around. They don't need to be in any particular order. But you'll notice when I click on the canvas, I can see those arrows. Those arrows are telling me what is the relationship. So when I click on that arrow, I will get all of those details. When I click on you know, the second frame, I click on that arrow, I get all of those details. Okay, so let's go ahead and click this flow. It created a flow for us on this page. So when I hit that play button, right, and I click, you can see that those transitions are now happening, right? They're going, they're great. And so it requires a click. Now, I could change that interaction to a bunch of other things, but for the purpose of this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click, I'm going to hold down the shift key. I'm actually going to click all three of those arrows. So I'm holding the shift key to make sure that I can select multiple things at the same time. So shift, click, shift, click, shift, click. And I got all of those arrows together. And now I can go here and I could change that on-click interaction to something else. I'm going to go ahead scroll all the way down and choose after delay. So what after delay means is that it's going to wait for a period of time before it moves on to that next frame. And because I want this animation to be instant, I'm going to change that to be about zero. So here we go. So now when I click that play button, right, the animation is just going, it's having a grand old time and it's doing its thing, right? It's having tons of fun. So what I'm going to do now is I already have some frames here. So I have one frame, two frame, three frame. I already have the after delays set up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite Lauren. Lauren, are you there? I'm here. All right. Brilliant. So are you in the file? I'm in the file. Do you want to, do you want to, do you want to make chatting, something? But I think you turned it off. Oh yeah. Here, let me bring my cursors back. All right. There's my cursors. Okay, cool. There's Lauren. Hey, hey, Lauren, how's it going? So what I'm going to have you do is uh, I want you to uh, uh, copy these frames and, and paste okay. your own little set down here. So paste your own little set. So, all right. Okay, yeah. cool. Now what I want you to do is to go to the assets panel. Okay. And, and grab a shape. I've got a triangle. Okay, you have a triangle. Uh, so Emily Sutter asked about uh, milliseconds. Um, so yeah, so milliseconds would just be like 100 milliseconds is like, you know, uh, one tenth of a second. 500 milliseconds is like a half a second. Uh, so everything is represented in milliseconds. I'm not sure if that was your question. Okay, cool. So now that you have the triangle, Lauren, what mm -hmm. I would like you to do is just duplicate that triangle into a subsequent frame and then okay. do it again. All righty. Awesome. So what you can do is now change some of those properties. So select the middle one, rotate mm -hmm. it, scale it, do whatever you want. Okay, I'm going to make it big, put it in the corner. Awesome. You're doing make, fantastic. I'll change the color. Cool. So uh, do the same thing on the last frame. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to work with you. We're going to play it together here. And uh, I'm going to just scale up this, 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 this frame over here. And then the last thing I want you to do is select your frame and change the background color of your frame. So make sure you're in design mode, change the fill color. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I am gonna click now on the prototype mode and I can see because you copy that first set of frames, now you have this play mode. And when I click play- The interaction's already there. Yeah, the interaction's already there. So I've already provided a stage for you and you're able to, to kind of like make that interaction and you can continue to iterate on this as well. So if I was to option drag, oops, I'm gonna select all three of your frames and I option drag. Now I have a copy of your animation and I can start to, to animate my own. Party triangle season. I love Party it. Party triangle season. I'm totally here for it. So what I would like to know if there's anybody that is in there. So let me know with your cursor if you would like to be an editor on this file and, and also make 
make one of these animations. So let me know with the cursor chat. Hit the forward slash key and let me know if you wanna if you wanna join in. Yes, we need some more volunteers for this All magic. Right, cool. Show. So let's get Catherine as an editor. Let's get Matt as an editor. Let's get Ifuanya as an editor. Let's get David as an editor. Let's get Jennifer as an editor. And so to make those folks editors, right? Um, all you have to do is you have to find who you're adding as an editor. I'm gonna make Lalo an editor, right? So now you are all in the file with us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you all to create a new page with your name on it. So if you look in the top left corner, you can create a new page. And when you create that new page, give that page your name. Maybe, maybe since the, the cursor chat disappeared, if people can say in the Zoom, if you want to become an editor, type type your name in the chat and I will upgrade you. Sorry, yes. just happened very fast. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Type your name in the chat and, and we can we can upgrade you there. So if I can just get some assistance with the upgrading, please. Yep, I'll, I'll put the mile on. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, cool. So go ahead, hit that plus on that new page, create a new page. And what you would like, what I would like you to do is copy these frames. So I'll, I'll make another copy here. So if you copy these three frames, so if you select you copy those frames and you paste them onto your page. And you can also just, just kind of work here. You can do the same thing and I'll walk you through all the steps again. So I see I got Lalo working over here. He's got his frames. Uh, let's see, Lalo, I'm actually gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a better set. There you go. All right, Lauren, you're already set there. Jen, all right, Jen, you got your pages set up. All right. Inuman, Catherine, you seem to be good, set to go. Now what I'd like you to do is just drop one of those assets into the frame. It should be the same asset across all three frames. There are a few particulars when it comes to Smart Animate. You need to make sure that the same element is represented and named accordingly across all three frames. So once you've been promoted to an editor, add a page, change the page to your name. I love seeing this. I love seeing you all join me here. Let us know once again, if uh, you would like to be an editor, we can have a few more editors here. Cool, so create that page for yourself and I will walk through, I'm gonna create another page for myself. So if you wanna watch and follow along with my screen, I'm gonna be on my new page and I'm gonna walk through the process once again. So I'm gonna hit the paste key. So I copied these three frames. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna double click and I'm gonna change that to my name. So I'm gonna just say Miggy Start, right? So I have these three frames. I'm gonna to go to my assets and I'm gonna go ahead and drop in, I'm gonna drop in that star. So I have that star, there it is. And I'm gonna copy it across all three frames. And now I can take that star and I'm gonna change just some of the properties, its rotation, its scale, right? And you'll notice that when you hover over it, you will see the instance also highlighted across all of the other frames. That's how you know they're wired up and they're working well. Let's see how folks are doing. So once again, yeah, grab it right from the assets. And the reason that we're doing it in this way is just to kind of provide some constraints. Right, we're trying to make an easy access point. You know, it might be very friction heavy to have to create your 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 own prototyping arrows on your first try. So this way, if you have those prototyping arrows already set up, then maybe you might have curiosity. You want to explore those arrows and begin to change some of those properties. You might change the timing. You might change the interaction. You might change various things that can. Uh, uh, augment or, or alter the output of that animation.
So here I'm going to hop back into my page. So on my page, once again, I went to my assets panel, and these are all components that are, are made inside of this file. I brought it across to each one of those frames and I already have the prototyping arrows set up. And now I can go ahead and once again, switch between the design mode and the prototype mode. That's going to be shift E. So here in the design mode, I can change the colors of each of my, my stars here. I can change by selecting the frame, the background. Uh, I can change the color there as well. So I can make like a little blue background for that first frame. I can make a little, you know, yellow background for the second frame. And for that third frame, I could add like a little, you know, let's make it a, a green background. So I have one, two, three. And now when I go to prototype mode and I hit play, it now works. And now as I'm watching this, let's say if I want to change it up, you know, I want to move something around, you know, you'll notice all I have to do is go back to my last page, right? So I don't even have to relaunch the prototype. So here the prototype is playing in my prototype window. Now when I go back, I just move this star and I can go back to my first tab and I can see how that influences that animation. So let's take a look and see how some of y'all are faring out. I'm going to take a look at Dan Schaefer's. So Dan, here you go. So you have some transitions taking place there. All right, let's close that out. Let's see who else we have here. I'm going to take a look at Shreya's. I'm going to hit play. Awesome. Now I'm able to see, right? So very quickly, you can see we're all just beginning with these same constraints, beginning to, to test the bounds, right? And there's going to be instances where something might not work. I'm going to take a look at David's. He, he was, you know, presenting yesterday. Let's see. Right. So like even here, right? This is okay. Air, uh, David decided to try out three different shapes. You know, I mentioned that this would only work with one concurrent shape across those frames. And as a result, you're going to get an unexpected output. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that it's different, you know? So here I'm going to have that smooth motion between all three. Now, one thing that I might suggest to David is saying, maybe you want to include all three shapes in all three frames, and then you can get a smoother bit of animation. So one thing that I can do here with David, I can actually duplicate his slides. So now I have my own copy and I could even say here, you know, I'm going to say MIGS. Right, <laughs> right. We're working along together. So here we go. Now I have a copy of David. So let me go ahead. I'm going to name this as David's. And this is how I run class, basically. Um, so here, I'm going to have that same copy, and I'm going to take a look at his three frames. So let's uh, let's open those up, and I can see he has polygon three, polygon two, polygon one. He's actually not even using my shapes. David is not following instructions, and that's okay. That's absolutely okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that polygon, you know, this polygon is in all three frames, right? I'm going to make sure that this polygon is in all three frames, and I'm going to make sure that this polygon is in all three frames. So I'm going to take it as a learning opportunity. Now, one other thing here, too, to be mindful of is that the ordering of them matters as well. So if I'm going to be animating these, right, I want to make sure it goes polygon three, one, two polygon let's see middle oh here we go polygon three one two and then let's see my end one let's move polygon three one two three one two right there's my middle one let me just rename these i'm gonna hit command r uh, i'm gonna say mig and get the current name there we go so there we go so three one two three one two three two one Boom. So now I have a new little bit of a sandbox where I have three elements. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to move them around. Let's make that one bigger. And now I'm going to take this one. I'm going to rotate this. Thank you, David. I'm so glad. This is like the perfect example. It's like David teed me up for a lesson right here. So here we go. Now I can play around with these. 
So me as the facilitator, I'm able to take a look and, and I can have my own version alongside David and I can kind of communicate maybe what I might do differently and say, and, and then, you know, we can kind of converse and, and discuss some of these changes, right? And I can even leave a comment. So I'm gonna hit C and be like, you know, you know, hey, David, I'm gonna type in his name, David, boom. Uh, check my example out. There we go. So now here, what I can do is I can go to the prototype menu and I have my own version of this. So here we go. Here's my version of it where we have those three shapes and it's like party shape time going on over here. Um, so Jennifer McKnight is asking me, is it possible to make one component change shapes? And the answer is no. Like when you're when you're animating in this way, um, you can have it do that, but it's gonna crossfade. Um, if you want the object to animate, it still has to be the same object to the same object. There's ways that you can play around with that. Like when I'm animating animated GIFs, um, I will have GIFs crossfade. Um, but typically what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you're kind of abiding within the bounds. Um, so here we go. I can see there's David's. Um, so you wouldn't be able to like import something from After Effects. So what you would be able to do is, uh, let's say, have an animated GIF and then bring the animated GIF into Figma. So if you wanted to have something that was representative in a prototype of a different type of motion, uh, with Figma, you're going to get very basic transitions, um, but you still can have a lot of power within those basic transitions. So here we go. So I'm able to kind of look between David and my own and can talk through them and, and kind of give that feedback. So let's see how all of you other folks are doing. Let's see. I am absolutely loving it. Like I am absolutely here for this. This is fantastic. So I will be more than happy to show you how to make a shape asset again. I'm gonna go over to my start file so I'm back here in my start file. So uh, Shannon, if you want to follow me, uh, you can go ahead, you can click on my icon right up here, and that'll give you the ability to follow me within that document. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to come up to this uh, top area, this menu that we have up here. I'm going to choose a shape object. So let's create a polygon. I'm going to draw a polygon onto the canvas. Now, as I mentioned before, you want to be in design mode. Design mode is going to give you that ability to change those properties. So here, let's say I make a red, you know, uh, triangle. Uh, I could actually change it because it's a polygon. I can actually change the number of points that we have here. So I could just drag this over here on the right, or I can drag the count circle on the triangle itself, giving me this really cool polygon. I could take it all the way up to like 60, which basically makes it a circle, or bring it back down to about like six or seven. So a seven is a heptagon. I don't know if you knew that, but a heptagon is seven sides. So what I'm going to do with this seven-sided object, I'm going to go ahead and uh, if I want, I can add a, a stroke value. Uh, the one thing that I will note is that strokes don't smart animate well. So in order to bake in that stroke, I'm going to right-click. I'm going to choose outline stroke. So what I have here, is a stroke that is also a fill. And uh, when I select these both, I can now make this into a component. So right up here is the component option. You can also right click, choose create component. The shortcut key for that is gonna be option command K and that's going to make it into a component. Once you make it into a component, it is now available in this document. Uh, to be duplicated from that assets panel. Um, so here in my start page, you can see that these components I have here. And I actually forgot the stroke. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna grab that stroke, I'm gonna cut it, uh, and I'm gonna paste it right back inside of that component. And so now that is uh, is there together. So here you'll see as I add this new polygon, let's give it a second to refresh in the library there. Now I can just drag it and I can have as many instances of this as I want. Now the way that the component system works in Figma is that that first component, that main one, 
dictates the rest. So if I was to change the color of that main component, you would see that change bubble up to the rest of them. So here, if I select that polygon in that main component, you can see I can start to make changes to it. I can even like offset it a little bit here and have this cool kind of like artistic style, you know, object. And, and this is one of the things that fascinated me about Figma is this sort of like component relationship that allows me to do such things. No worries. All right, cool. So I'm going to take a look at a few more. So let's see, Ethel, Chantal. And now those of you, I, I, I would just love some feedback. You know, what do you think? Um, oh, Shannon, yes, you can do type as a component. So if you want to add some type and you can make it as a component. And when you have that type as a component, it'll, it'll, it'll update, but you can also override it. So I can override this um, instance here, but I can still change some of those main properties that haven't been overridden. So there's a little mini component lesson. So those of you, have you found this helpful? Is there any questions that you have? Does anybody like me to preview what they've created? Ooh, I'm going to take a look at Stevens. Oh, and look at this. Steven just knocking it out of the house. See, I love seeing this exploration. You you kind of create some guardrails, you know, and you'd be surprised at what people start to make and what they start to create. And the one thing that I'm definitely going to encourage is try not to say like that something is, is right or wrong, right? Everything is an exploration. It's right if it works well for you. You know, leave the right and wrong for when it's time for them to have a job and and they're like you know working on design systems and and managing libraries you know for now make sure that there is a lot of play that's imbued in the activities uh, that you're providing them you know give them the ability to decipher what is working for them and what is the right communication style for them So can I tell you how to add it as an asset to a project? So um, I'm guessing that that question is how to publish a library. Uh, so I see a question, can you tell us how to add an asset to a project? Um, so if you have these assets here, right? So these are the assets that I made. These are just components. So if I draw uh, uh, an object, so if I make like a little rectangle, and, you know, um, I give that a color and I can even do something. I, I'm going to take a little inspiration from, from David uh, and his presentation where he was making union objects. So let's say here I have these two objects. And uh, I'm going to apply them as strokes. I'm going to press shift X to fill the, 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 the stroke and uh, the fill, I'm gonna swap those. I'm gonna select those two objects. I'm gonna make them as a union, and then I'm gonna round out those corners. So here, I have this kind of unique shape that I just generated, a la David Curran. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create it as a component. So this is now a union component, and I'm gonna give this a name. So I'm gonna call this the Curran component. Um, and you'll see that where I created this, I actually made this in Lauren's page. So here it is, here it is available. Um, so now what I'm able to do is if I want to publish this and make this available to another document, um, what I can do is I can go here and publish styles and components. And I can actually publish this to make it usable in other documents within the same team. So if I've created my education space, I created my team space with my students, and let's say they made something like name cards that you want to reuse again and again, you could easily do that and include it. Um, you can make it available to them. So Matt Cram does the same, where he makes those components, he publishes them, he makes them available to students, and then he then retains the ability to then update those components and push it to his students' files as well. So um, cool. 
So I'm just really hoping that this is inspiring for you all. Um, I'm going to close it out here. I'm just going to do a little demo. I'm going to do one of my favorite demos um, that I have. Uh, this is just a little bit of, you know, this is to get this in the recording. Uh, I just want to highlight just one of my favorite examples. This example was posed to me, you know, by a student. Uh, I think I mentioned the uh, aperture example. So I'm going to put an aperture example. Um, and it's a little bit complex, but, you know, this, this, this exploration came about from just a student being like, hey, how do you do that? And it just caused me to, to dig in deep. And we actually went back and forth. And then another student chimed in and they came up with a better uh, solution to that project problem. So I'm just going to walk you through here how I made that happen. So uh, let's let's just go. So I'm going to close this out with a little bit of, of performance art, as it will. It'll be demo performance art. So I'm going to click on my shape tool. I'm going to draw a polygon. I'm going to draw this polygon right here. Now you'll notice this polygon has a little bit of the excess bounce. So I'm going to press Shift E, or I'm sorry, not Shift E, Command E. And what that's going to do, it's going to outline it. It's going to make sure that it's no longer a, a triangle editable object, but now it's a solid individual three points, right? So this is just a vector shape. So I have this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it into a component. So this is my polygon one. I'm going to call it shutter shutter piece you always want to make sure you name your objects otherwise everything is going to be indecipherable when you go to take a look at it later so what i'm going to do here with this shutter piece i'm going to hold down the option key i'm going to drag this just above i'm going to hold down the shift key to keep that even i'm going to rotate it so here we go so i have these two pieces now i'm going to select those two pieces together i'm going to copy paste right drag this to the right copy paste drag this to the right, and I have all of these pieces together that I now want to be as a whole object. So I'm going to select them all together, and I'm also going to make that into a component. But because a component can't be stuck inside of another component, it actually pushes it out. But that's okay. That's to my advantage. So I'm going to call this the shutter. Now, what's cool about this is now this piece acts as a control for the second piece. So I'm going to hold down the command key. I'm going to hold down the command key and the space bar, and you'll see that what I'm able to do is now control these this set of components uh, with this main one. So here we go. I'm holding down the space bar, and I'm able to control this just as it would uh, a shutter. So I'm going to go back to the design panel. I'm going to select that triangle. I'm going to click on the stroke. I'm going to choose the stroke to be in the center. I'm going to set that value to white. And I'm going to increase it just a little bit. Let's say about a value of eight. So here we go. So now we'll get a much better sense of how this is playing through. So I'm going to option, or I'm sorry, command click to select that triangle. And here we go. I can see the shutter is beginning to work out. Now, the cool thing about this is what I'm going to do is I want to create a relationship between those two objects. I'm going to draw it a frame. And I have a frame over here to my left. Um, and I'm going to draw a little circle in that frame. And I'm going to put it right about there. I'm going to make that circle green. And the reason that I'm making the circle green, it's actually going to be a mask for any of you that might be already familiar with design tools. And now I'm going to duplicate a copy of that shutter into this space, right? And let's, uh, let's select them both. I'm going to align them both to the center. So I'm going to select these two objects. I'm going to right click and let's say uses mask. Right? So now it's been masked out by that circle. So in Figma, the mask is actually going to be behind it, and it's going to move on up through to the top. So you'll see here when I move this shape, right, it's controlling those others, right? Like I love this concept, and I love the uh, ideation that this inspires. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to select these two, and I'm going to create them as a component set. I'm going to make them as variants. So if you, you blinked, you missed it. When I select these two main components, I'm going to click Combine as Variants. Now they are together. By the way, I totally have this demo on my TikTok, TikTok slash Professor Figma. So I'm going to say Set 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate both of these together. I'm going to drag these down. And you see that it renamed that to set two, but I don't want that to be called set two. I'm actually going to change that back to set one because I want to trick Figma into animating this frame to this next frame. So I'm going to drag my triangle. I'm going to move my triangle over. 
and let's make our prototype. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just make a very simple prototype here. I'm gonna have this object. When I click on it, go to the second one. I'm gonna choose Smart Animate. Let's make a, let's make it a gentle one. No, I'm gonna stick with what I know. I'm gonna make it my little S curve, my in and out. And it's gonna to navigate to frame two. And when I click on this one, I'm gonna have it navigate back. So there you go. And let's take a look and see how that works. So when I click, it opens the shutter. When I click, it closes the shutter. Open, close, open, close. Now that's the exact same concept that I use when I made those, 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 those interesting bits where I have this sort of relationship between these new objects, the, the simple to the uh, sort of complex geometrically then onto a frame. Um, and then because all of these maintain the same names, it creates this relationship allowing me to animate them. I could even do fun things like change the color. So I can go ahead, I could change the color. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty close, right? So let's go ahead and just kind of close this out. And there we go. So now I have my, my fun geometric shutter. Um, and, and, and also us, we have this amazing file with all of our explorations where I can go through. I now have this evidence of this activity uh, that we that we worked on together, um, and I can easily go through and review. I don't have to open up a new file for everyone. I don't have to download like 50 animations. I could just easily browse through every individual's name and see how your work came along. I can see how you participated. Um, and once again, too, if I'm at all concerned, uh, I can actually look at my my version history and I can see everyone that had kind of participated in the activity along the way. So if you're at all, you know, you have to file an activity report for your students, you want to see their engagement, you know, you have a little bit of insight into it, though I would recommend that you stay away from treating it as, as a bit of surveillance. You know, students are going to work in their own files, give them their own space, make sure you're, you're, you're communicating to them, you know, that this is a safe space, this is a space for play, this is how you learn, and this is where you work together.